The 46-year-old Alexandra dated her diary through to the end of the summer, but the last entry is on July the 16th. Grey morning after lovely sunshine. Tatiana started to read from the prophet Obadiah. Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. Played Bazik with Nicholas, 10.30 to bed, 15 degrees. At 1.30 a.m. on July 17th, the family was woken up by Yurovsky and told to prepare to move once again. They were led into a small basement room. There, the 11 prisoners, the family and a small retinue, were suddenly confronted by 11 armed men. There had only been time for incoherent exclamations. Both Yurovsky and one of the guards, Medvedev, recorded in legal depositions their versions of what had happened. Pavel Medvedev. All the members of the Tsar's family were lying on the floor, very severely wounded. The blood was running in streams. Yakov Yurovsky. I myself killed Nicholas point blank. Alexandra Fyodorovna died immediately. Alexei and three of his sisters were still alive. We had to finish them off. We tried to bayonet one of the girls, but the bayonet would not penetrate her corsage. We undressed the girl and found a corset torn in places by bullets through which diamonds could be seen. Pavel Medvedev. The heir to the throne was still alive and mourning a little. Yurovsky fired two or three times at him. Then the air was still. This telegram to the bosses in Moscow announced in a prearranged code that the whole family was dead. Nicholas has been shot and his family sent to a safe place. The bodies of the Romanov family were taken by truck to the mine, hacked to pieces, soaked in sulfuric acid, burned on a bonfire, and then thrown down the shaft. But Yurovsky worried that his efforts had been rather too public. The next night, in deepest secrecy, the fragments of skeleton and burnt flesh were exhumed and buried elsewhere. For half a century, the Romanovs and their mortal remains would disappear. The White Army took Ekaterinburg within a week of the assassination. They had no doubts about what had happened. And the Tsar's family was not alone. Every Romanov the Bolsheviks could find, they murdered. Nicholas's brother Michael, nine uncles and cousins, and Alexandra's sister Ella, 18 Romanovs in all. For years, it was debated what part, if any, Lenin had played in ordering the execution of Nicholas and his family. Long secret Bolshevik papers have now revealed the following. Lenin, Trotsky, and Sverdlov worked out this very cunning plan, empowering the Yekaterinburg Soviet to liquidate the family, using as a pretext all sorts of fabricated plots, attacks, and attempts to rescue them. And I have documentary proof of this. For example, Goloshokin, head of the Yekaterinburg Soviet, went to Moscow twice just before the killings. Twice he was in Moscow for instructions, for meetings with Lenin, Sverdlov and others. 
It was all pre-planned. The foul act of annihilating Nicholas II was not accidental. The local Bolsheviks appeared to have carried out the murders on their own initiative. But it now seems clear that it was on orders from Lenin. Lenin took great care, however, to hide the truth even from his ambassador to Berlin, Adolf Ioffe. In 1918, when my father was Soviet ambassador in Berlin, he received a communication down the line from Moscow that the former Tsar Nicholas II had been shot. He asked, and what about the family? He got no reply, and somehow the question was hushed up. And when Dzerzhinsky, head of the secret police passed through Berlin, father leant on him and said, why did you not reply to my queries when everyone was asking me, from the Kaiser down, all Alexander's relatives you know? Dzerzhinsky replied, it was a special order from Lenin. He said, let Yofa be told nothing. It will be easier for him to lie about it there in Berlin. For over half a century, Lenin and his lies held sway. No one even knew where the remains of the imperial family were buried, until 1979, when years of private and top-secret research pinpointed a certain submerged bridge not far from the original mine. One morning, at the beginning of May, we came here at 6 o'clock when there was no one around. We removed a few planks and immediately, buried not very deep, we found some human remains. There were several of us when we found the remains. We were all in a state of shock. It was terrible. It was really frightening, because the remains were mutilated by sulfuric acid, and the bones were all black and green. This heap of bones filled us with horror. We were lucky in that we found three skulls almost immediately. We covered everything up straight away, but kept the skulls with us, as we wanted to have them identified. Identification was to become the key issue. In 1991, the remains were exhumed yet again, officially. But two skeletons were missing. So were these bones truly those of the last Tsar and his family? The latest DNA analysis would provide the answer by comparing the Romanov bones with tissue from living relatives. Exactly 100 years to the day after the accession of Nicholas II to the Romanov throne, Queen Elizabeth II of Britain visited the Peter and Paul Fortress, traditional burial place of all the other Romanov czars. It was the Queen's husband, Prince Philip, one of the closest living relatives of both Nicholas and Alexandra, who gave the crucial blood sample for DNA comparison. After exhaustive testing and squabbling, the results proved, with 99% accuracy, that the remains are indeed those of some of the Romanovs. One daughter and the son have not been accounted for so rumors of Romanov surviving the assassination live on, however unlikely. Even the DNA results failed to convince the Russian church to consecrate the remains, however, because Nicholas's skull was not tested. They forbade burial until still further tests were complete. Based strictly on primary sources, the book The Romanov Royal Martyrs offers previously unpublished texts in English from various archival sources. An impressive 512-page book featuring more than 200 black and white photographs 
and a 56-page full-color photo insert.